Okay, so the movie goes like this. The biggest drug cartels in the world get together and buy up all the media and all the politicians and force all the people in the world to stay locked in their homes. And people can only come out if they take the cartel's drugs and keep taking them over and over. I threw the script in Last thing before we go tonight, the train to Crazy Town made an unscheduled whistle stop in Ohio this week. You've no doubt heard the conspiracy theory that they are injecting some sort of electronic tracking device in liquid form through a needle into our arms. Today, the head of the Maui Emergency Management Agency resigned. This as we continue to hear from families who lost loved ones in the Maui fires. Every service in this city is going to be impacted. All of us. Are we alone in the universe? It's a question scientists have tried to answer for a long time, and we may be a step closer to answering that question. As a Israel, we are in a war. Not in a war, So in a number of comments uh, recently, uh, after my last few videos, people were saying a phrase along the lines of, the Lord doesn't beat his bride, or Jesus is not an abusive husband. And this was in response to the idea I was putting forth in my videos that the bride of Christ will indeed go through tribulation, whether you want to call it the tribulation or just end times persecution in general, and not be raptured out uh, before major worldwide persecution breaks out, as is commonly taught in most modern evangelical churches for you know the past at least several decades, but going back at least to the 60s and the late great planet Earth. And I've been thinking about this quite a bit ever since reading uh, those comments and responding as best I could in the moment, but I'd really never heard this type of phrase or argument before, this idea that going through an intense period of trial or persecution in the last days is is actually itself some twisted doctrine, and one that actually is being said to be guilty of misrepresenting God, you know, in a pretty serious way, whereby it's claimed that God becomes this abusive husband, and anyone who's preaching or entertaining such an idea is lacking in faith, and portraying Jesus in a way that is completely opposite of his true character. So I have several thoughts about this as I've been trying to kind of put together a video about it, and it only kind of became that much more relevant as everything has been kicking off over in uh, the Middle East, I guess we could call it, as I sit down to record this the Saturday after the big Israeli 9-11 Hamas attack situation. And as I'm recording this, you know, ground invasion into Gaza is pretty much imminent. So we'll get to that in a little bit. But uh, most immediately, it really does strike me as nothing short of an insult to the millions of brothers and sisters who've gone before us and already died at the hands of, you know, the Roman emperors and the popes. As, you know, the Vatican has the blood of millions of Christians on its hands uh, over the centuries and on down through history, whether by religious intolerance of other faiths or at the hands of atheistic communist regimes from the 20th century forward. But in the modern Western world, we've lived through a fairly unique period of unprecedented ease and comfort, particularly in the United States, where the doctrines of dominionist dispensationalism first took root and spread, not surprisingly, along with the various sub-doctrines such as the pre-trib rapture teaching and the sacred cow of political Zionism. 
And this unprecedented comfort and freedom has effectively made us soft, I would argue, and vulnerable to that which 1 Timothy 4.3 warned about when it says, For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but have itching ears, they will heap to themselves teachers in accordance with their own lusts. And it's not difficult to understand why it would be more appealing to church congregations to be told that we shall not have to suffer the types of hardship we read about in the New Testament itself, nor in the annals of history as men chose to face death with resolve and gladness rather than denounce their faith. But what I do find harder to understand is the fact that this late-stage teaching of the invisible any-moment rapture almost inevitably coincides with its parent doctrine of the special prophetic place held for national earthly Israel, the nation-state. In almost every well-known church and pulpit which teaches the pre-trib rapture, we simultaneously hear that the Jewish nation was brought back into existence by divine fulfillment in the year 1948, and through this resurrected political vessel, God will allow the Jewish people to endure a period of unimaginable trial and persecution and threat of annihilation at the hand of the spirit of Antichrist, which is said to be operating through Islam and Iran and terrorist organizations and everything, and potentially Russia joining in at some point and all the rest. But they will be rescued at the last hour by the unwrathful return of Christ, either at the Battle of Armageddon or the Gog Magog War, and thus all Israel will be saved. That's, that's kind of the mantra of it all. In a military intervention by Jesus himself. In other words, it is an eschatological paradigm which effectively teaches that there are two brides, not one. And that while we cannot dare to imagine that God would allow his beloved Gentile bride to go through the fire and be refined and perfected for her groom, Somehow the idea that God would allow the Jewish bride to go through such unthinkable testing is not regarded as contradictory at all. And that's what just kind of blows my mind about the whole, the whole narrative. And perhaps it is simply this question of who is Israel that is the real question that must be settled before the rapture issue should even be discussed. Who is the bride? This is almost a more controversial topic than prophecy timelines, questioning the Copernican cosmic order, and so many other things, but the Bible has more to say about it than even those, I would argue, and there's no reason for us to be in confusion about it if we simply look to the scriptures. In John 10, 16, Jesus himself says, And other sheep I have which are not of this fold. Them also I must bring, and they shall hear my voice, and they shall be one fold and one shepherd. In Ephesians 4, 4 through 6, Paul says, There is one body and one spirit, even as ye are called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one Lord and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in you all. In Hebrews 11 we read, By faith Abraham, when he was called to go out into a place which he should after receive for an inheritance, obeyed, and he went out, not knowing whither he went. By faith he sojourned in the land of promise, in a strange country, dwelling in tabernacles with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs with him of the same promise. For he looked for a city which hath foundations, whose builder and maker is God. Through faith also Sarah herself received strength to conceive seed, and was delivered of a child when she was past age, because she judged him faithful who had promised. Therefore sprang there even of one, and him as good as dead, so many as the stars of the sky in multitude, and as the sand which by the seashore is innumerable. These all died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off, and were persuaded of them, and embraced them, and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. For they that say such things declare plainly that they seek a country, and truly, if they had been mindful of that country from whence they came out, they might have had opportunity to have returned. But now they desire a better country, that is, a heavenly one. Wherefore God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he hath prepared for them a city. So one body, one faith, one baptism, one hope, one calling, one spirit, one mediator between God and man. One inheritance, 
that is an eternal city, an eternal country, and one bride. That is what I find to be the repeated and clear testimony of Scripture, wherever you look into it, if you are open to hearing what it really says. But for the sake of time, I'll set aside this foundational issue and let the viewer look into it on their own. But its relationship to Bible prophecy and the question of who will be called to endure the end is what I hope to establish here. In growing up in church myself, I confess I always struggled with this a bit with the whole allegory of the Bride of Christ. And I don't know if that's just, as a dude, it's something that's kind of harder to know how to relate to it. You know, being the bride as a man and, you know, like this allegory with Jesus and his bride. And it, at least it was for me. I don't know. But so much of what Jesus has to say about the end of the age was built around this whole wedding picture. The parable of the wise and foolish virgins warns us to keep watch and have oil in our lamps when the bridegroom returns, lest we have the door shut on us when he finally arrives. And these verses too, of course, are used to try and argue that the return of Christ must be some sudden, invisible, pre-trib rapture of the saints, but again, I would argue that it actually refutes this more thoroughly than most pre-trib apologists would even typically assume. When the door is shut, it is shut, and there is no further appearance of the bridegroom to give another chance for the foolish virgins. Whether we want to call them the left-behind saints, or the Jewish nation in Israel, or anyone else. But yet, this is precisely what we are taught in mainstream churchianity, for lack of a better word. Because some explanation has to be given for what we read time and time again throughout the pages of the book of Revelation and elsewhere. In Revelation 6, 9-11, through 11, when he opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of those who had been slain for the word of God and for the witness they had borne. They cried out with a loud voice, O Sovereign, Lord, holy and true, how long before you will judge and avenge our blood on those who dwell on the earth? Then they were each given a white robe and told to rest a little longer until the number of their fellow servants and their brothers should be complete, who were to be killed as they themselves had been. So again, we see from the Bible that God does indeed allow some of his own to experience the persecution being written about here, whatever we might choose to rationalize as the portion or remnant but it's in there, and everyone knows it, so how does it make sense? And now we are seeing support for Israel, support for Palestine, support for, you know, it, it's a dialectic. <laughs> it's a classic dialectic of you, you've got to pick the, the right side. We all know which side the mainstream media is cheering for and the narratives that they are pushing in terms of the Iranian funding of it all and, and all that, but the Bible gives us a totally different picture, I, I would say, than either of the narratives being presented by the news and, you know, mega churches, or conversely, the, the opposing side that is still looking at it all through a non-spiritual lens. I mean, that's the irony of, of the whole thing, is that it's, it's supposedly all about spirituality, and this war between good and evil, and all the other rhetoric they're using, but the real war between good and evil, as the Bible presents it, it is between the kingdoms of this world the Babylonian system, the Antichrist spirit, the beast system, whatever you want to call it, and the gospel of the kingdom. And those who have been born again into that kingdom. That is the battle that we find in the Bible. And so ultimately this is all, you could look at it as like the longest running false flag operation, theological false flag operation uh, in, in modern history, if not all of history. And it's pretty amazing to think about. We know that God is allowing all this to happen. Nothing is catching him by surprise. So no matter what, this is all playing into the fulfillment of prophecy one way or another. So, you know, I'm not trying to say that, that God is not in control or God is not actually using all these pieces on, on Satan's little chessboard to accomplish his purposes because that's how he works. That's even with the most evil agendas and powers in high places, they are all ultimately serving the will of God in the end. That's the, kind of the most amazing thing about Bible prophecy. And right now we hear a lot of Bible teachers talking about Isaac and Ishmael and how the current conflict traces all the way back to those two brothers and that sort of being, you know, the biblical basis, so to speak, for the, um, for the hatred and the enmity between these, uh, these people groups. 
But I found this really interesting uh, sermon. I don't even know who this pastor's name is, but from the Secret Secrets Unsealed channel, and it's affiliated with the Secrets Unsealed ministry, and I believe the guy is Seventh Day Adventist. So I'm certainly not uh, endorsing everything the guy teaches because I don't. I haven't. I would just watch this one sermon that somebody sent me, but I thought it was one of the best explanations of what the, the Bible says about the child of the bondwoman and the child of the true bride and how Jacob and Esau <laughs> really breaks down from their perspective of Jesus. And I got a I got a little some excerpts from it. Hopefully they don't they don't mind me playing this, but and then you can go listen to it yourself if you want a more in depth study. It's one of the best studies I've ever listened to about this whole topic of who is Israel and what the children of the promise is really all about. Now Let's go to Galatians chapter 3. Galatians chapter 3. I want you to remember what we're studying this evening because this is the foundation for most of what we're going to discuss concerning Bible prophecy. See, the big issue in the interpretation of Bible prophecy, folks, is who is Israel? If you get that straight, who is Israel? you'll get prophecy straight. If you don't understand who is true Israel, you will get prophecy wrong. You see, Israel is not those who live in the Middle East, who live in Jerusalem, whose last name is Goldstein, who have the literal blood of Abraham flowing through their veins. True Israel are those who have joined Jesus. Now notice Galatians chapter 3 verse 26. Galatians 3 verse 26. Here the Apostle Paul says, You are all sons of God. See, he picks up on this idea of sons of God. Sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. How do we become sons of God? Through faith in Christ Jesus. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. And then he says that all ethnic and national distinctions disappear doesn't mean that there's still not people from the United States and people from Israel and people from Egypt. What it means that in the sight of God, national distinctions mean nothing anymore. Verse 28, it says there, there is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave nor free, there is neither male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. Verse 29, and if you are Christ's, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Who are going to inherit all of the promises that God made to Abraham? Those who are Christ's. So my question is, are any of the promises being inherited today by those who reject the Lord in the Middle East? Absolutely not. And I'll tell you what, the Apostle Paul says that the Jews of his day were actually children of the bondwoman. They were not Israelites at all. And that's why in Revelation it says that the final war of Satan will be against those who keep the commandments of God. Not to earn salvation, but because they know Jesus and they say, I will be loyal to my beloved Jesus even to the point of death if necessary. Jesus says, you are of your father the devil. Were they Abraham's children? Yes and no. They were Abraham's children, but according to Ishmael, not according to Isaac. And only through Isaac were the promises to be inherited. So if the Jewish nation today is rejecting Christ, they are in what? They are in bondage. And they are children of the bondwoman. And because they're in bondage, they have no right to inherit anything that belongs to Abraham and to Isaac. Are you understanding what I'm saying? No. Am I saying that I'm against the Jews? No. Do you know what? That conflict in the Middle East would end in an instant if Jews and Arabs received Jesus. They'd have no more reason to fight. Because both of them would be Jews. <laughs> According to the biblical definition, if, if the Palestinians said, we receive Jesus as our Savior, even though they are physically sons of the bondwoman, because they received Jesus, they would be Israelites. And the Israelites, who are also sons of the bondwoman, 
because they reject Jesus, if they receive Jesus, they would also be Israelites. And then they would say, now you're an Israelite, I'm an Israelite. What are we fighting about? Are you with me? The key in prophecy is found in Jesus. And it's not found in your national origin. It is not found in the land that you live in. So Jesus says in verse 44, You are of your father the devil, and the desires of your father you want to do. He was a murderer from the beginning. He's saying, you want to murder me, so who's your father? He was a murderer from the beginning, and does not stand in the truth, because there is no truth in, in him. When he speaks a lie, he speaks of his own resources, for he is a liar and the father of it. Wow. Did Jesus agree with the Apostle Paul? Who are the children of God? Those who have received Jesus. So who does the devil hate? Does the devil hate Jesus? Of course he does. Now if he hates Jesus, who else is he going to hate? Those who have joined Jesus. So who is the final war going to be against? Listen, the devil has the Jews in his pocket if they're outside Christ. He doesn't have to worry about them because there's no salvation outside Jesus. But the devil has tried to make it appear like, like, the, like the Jews are God's favorite people as a theocracy, as a nation, and that the devil hates them and God loves them. Now I'm talking about them as a nation, as individuals. Any of them can accept Jesus Christ. And by the way, any people from any nation that rejects Jesus is in the same boat. So I'm not picking on the Jews. I mean, it can be a Mexican too. A Mexican who does not receive Jesus is a son of the bondwoman. A Colombian, an Indian, doesn't matter where you're from. If you reject Jesus, you are a son of the bondwoman because you have not experienced the second birth, the birth according to the Spirit. John chapter 4 and verses 21 to 24. Very significant words. He says this, Jesus said to her, Woman, believe me, the hour is coming when you will neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem worship the Father. You know what Jesus is saying? No more holy city, no more holy mountains, no more holy temples because now everything is shifting to the heavenly Mount Zion to the heavenly Jerusalem and to the heavenly temple where I am going to go to minister by the way do you know that Jesus said where there are two or three gathered in my name there I am in their midst see Zion Z Mount Zion is where Jesus is Jesus is not where Mount Zion is. In other words, you want to know where Jerusalem is today, where Mount Zion is today, where the temple is today, all you have to do is discover where Jesus is. And by the way, can we enter by faith into Jerusalem, into the temple? Can we go to the temple today and worship in spirit and in truth? The whole book of Hebrews says that we can approach the throne of God through faith. We can approach boldly the throne of grace. That's not over in Jerusalem, but it's the temple in heaven where Jesus ministers. And now notice, Jesus says, we're not going to worship in Jerusalem or on this mountain, the Father. You worship what you do not know. We know what we worship for salvation is of the Jews. And what he means is that salvation came as a result of God calling Abraham and the Jewish nation. Jesus the Messiah came from, from Jews. It's not the, that the Jews saved. It's that the Savior came from the Jews. And then notice what we find in verse 23. But the hour is coming, and now is, when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth in spirit and in truth. Did you catch that? For the Father is seeking such to worship Him. God is spirit and those who worship Him must worship Him in spirit and in truth. Where is Mount Zion today? 
where Jesus is. And where is Jesus? Where two or three are gathered in my name, there I am in their midst. So in what geographical locality is the final battle going to be fought? It's going to be fought against Zion and Jerusalem. But where is Jerusalem? Where Jesus is. And where is Jesus? Where two or three are gathered in His name. Which means that the final battle is going to be a battle against God's people where? All over the world! And they're going to be attacked by a system known as Babylon which is also a worldwide system. In other words, the final battle is not between the Arabs and the Jews. It's between those who have received Jesus on a worldwide scale and those who rejected Christ or who claim to have accepted Christ but are in bondage because they're trying to bring about salvation on their own. And so a friend gave me this book I know I've been talking about Philip Morrow a number of times in, in videos, but I finally got my hands on a copy of this book he wrote called Things Which Soon Must Come to Pass. And I'm, I'm still making my way through it, but it's basically just a big verse-by-verse -verse Bible study of Revelation. And he just approaches it from the standpoint of everything we need to know about what the symbolism and how to interpret these visions of John at Patmos are found in the rest of Scripture itself. And that's just what he does, and he, he's a very uh, patient and methodical you know, student of all that. And it's, it's really, you know, in some ways it's just kind of confirming things that I've been finding on my own through Bible study over the years. But, but there's also elements that continue to kind of maybe challenge some of my assumptions or, or hold over. You know, I read an excerpt from what he wrote about the Millennium uh, in my last longer video, and uh, I apologize if the... Uh, if the visuals were just a little bit too much there, I'm trying to kind of find the balance. But anyways, I wanted to read, I'm just going to read from the foreword of this book, a little excerpt, because it kind of blew my, it's like this isn't even the actual book. This is just, just something he wrote after, you know, just as the foreword to it, but even this was like kind of mind-blowing, so. He says, first of all, it is to be observed that the breakup of the Jewish nation, talking about AD 70, marked the transition of God dealing with mankind from the economy of the Old Covenant to that of the New Covenant. For at that era the Old Covenant, that of the letter, with its temple, priesthood, sacrifices, ordinances, and especially its chosen nation, was completely abolished by the instrumentality of a series of sweeping judgments, thereby making room for the New Covenant, that of the Spirit, with its spiritual house, the Church of God and of Jesus Christ, its spiritual sacrifices, and its holy nation, composed of the elect out of every nation, tongue, and tribe of the earth. 1 Peter 2, 5 and 9. That cataclysmic event, the destruction of the temple, was truly a tremendous moment for all future generations, one for which no parallel can be found in human history. For never before or since has a nation been blotted out of existence, whose surviving people have been dispersed throughout the other nations of the world, resisting destruction and amalgamation alike, and maintaining for centuries their distinctive racial characteristics and identity. This is written in 1925, by the way. This is what kind of amazes me. So this is pre-1948, pre-World War II, and even just before the, the crash of 29 and such. To this unique feature of history and to its dominating effect in determining the character of the Christian era, appropriate consideration will be given in this volume. But for the purpose of these introductory comments, it suffices to call attention to the fact that there went forth at that time out of Judea and Jerusalem into all the world two diverse sorts of people, converted Jews and unconverted Jews. For at the time of her birth pangs, it was with Jerusalem as with her prototype, Rebecca, and that two manner of people were in her womb, Genesis 25, 23. So now we're talking about uh, the generation after Isaac and Ishmael. And the analogy goes further. For like as the diverse careers of Jacob and Esau were foretold before their birth, even so the prophecies of the Old and New Testaments foretold the character and effect of the influences upon the Gentile world for good in one case and for evil in the other, of those two outflowing streams of Jewish humanity. The contrast between Jacob and Esau, as God sees it, 
was the greatest possible, as is evidenced by the words, Jacob have I loved, but Esau have I hated, Romans 9.13. And that between the two divisions of the Jewish race was fully as great. Not only so, but the historical order of the birth of these two peoples of common origin corresponds with that of the two sons of Isaac. First that which is natural, and afterward that which is spiritual. And eventually the younger is to have dominion. The words of the apostle, so there was a division because of him, John 7.43, have a significance deeper and wider far than might at first appear. For that division produced the greatest possible of all human contrasts. One group comprised regenerated Jews, those who received him and were born of God, John 1, 11 through 13, these being the true Israel. For they are not all Israel that are of Israel, the Israel of God. The other group comprised the unregenerate Jews, those who received him not, they being the natural Israel, Israel after the flesh. The greatest of the contrast is impressed upon us by the scriptures which declare that the one company were the children of God and the other the children of the devil. 1 John 1, Romans 9, John 3. It follows that their needs must have been, that's a, like a weird phrase they use in the 20s, their needs must have been. It follows that there must have been a difference correspondingly great between the effects exerted upon the Gentile peoples and their governments in institutions by these two families, respectively. All of which was foreseen from the beginning and was a part of God's plan for the accomplishment of his eternal purpose in Christ Jesus and for the establishment of his everlasting kingdom. For to Abraham, the human instrument through whom that plan was to be executed, God gave promise that he would bless him and make him a blessing, and that through him and his seed all the families of the earth should be blessed, which promise and like promises have been fulfilled through the believing Jews, whom Christ commissioned to go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Mark 16, these being the true children of Abraham, according as it is written, quote, they which are of faith, the same are the children of Abraham, Galatians 3. On the other hand, it was foretold from the beginning of the nation of Israel and by Moses, its founder, that if they should forsake the covenant of their God, he would root them out of their land in anger and in such manner as to cause astonishment to all the nations. Deuteronomy 29. But this subject is too vast and ramified to admit of more than a passing reference to it here. What is of chief importance for the purpose of this exposition is the fact, for which proof will be given hereafter, that from the impact of those two tides of Jewish humanity upon the stagnant and decaying masses of the Gentiles, there have eventuated two vast and potent dominions of a spiritual nature, which, though invisible, are most real and active, namely, the kingdom of God and the empire of international finance. He said this in 1925. Both are invisible and both are international, and there are other points of resemblance which need not be noticed here. It is the unique character of the kingdom of God in this age, in the words of its founder, it cometh not with observation, Luke 17. That is, its nature during the present era of the gospel is such that its presence is not manifest to the eye by any of the usual accompaniments of government. For it has no visible constitution or administrative machinery, yet it is a real and worldwide dominion, every member of which has been born of God, John 3.3. 3. Likewise, the empire of finance, now existent in the form commonly called credit capitalism, though its existence is clearly recognized, and though the industrial enterprises and the commerce of the whole world are subject to its despotic sway, is without observation, for it is, in the Bible sense of the word, a mystery. But its potency and its universal sway are nonetheless real. The coexistence of these two spiritual empires, their worldwide dominion, their mutual antagonism, their competition for the allegiance of men, and the necessity on their part of making a definite choice between them were clearly indicated by the Lord in a pregnant word of admonition to his disciples. You cannot serve God and mammon. It is noteworthy that the mission and the social influence of each of those spiritual agencies was to be of age-long duration. For by the word of Christ himself, the work of his disciples in propagating the kingdom of God was to continue, quote, unto the end of the age, Matthew 28. And on the other hand, the dispersion of the unbelieving Jews was to last until the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. The human material upon which those two diverse spiritual forces were to exert themselves was the population of the Gentile world, which was in a state of corruption, darkness, and gradual decay. 
much like today. Those forces were to encounter Greek philosophy, Roman cynicism, and barbaric idol worship, these being but different developments of the corrupt human nature common to all those whom God had given up to their own desires and to a reprobate mind, because they did not like to retain God in their knowledge. And now, in Christendom of today is manifest the result of 19 centuries, now 20, of the impact upon the heathen world of those mighty spiritual agencies that went forth from Judea in the first century of our era. What has been the outcome thus far? Confining our observation to the Christianized part of the world, we find that in our day the preoccupation of the great majority of human beings is with economics, or to use the more familiar term business. This is, and for several generations, has been the object of supreme human interest to which even religion and politics are subordinated. The reason is apparent for the prime necessities of human life, as well as all comforts, luxuries, rank and position in society, and all other things dear to the heart of man are involved. And at this hour of economic depression, the deep conviction of the vast majority is that the welfare of mankind, if not the very existence of, quote, civilization, depend upon the speedy restoration of business prosperity. So this might have been written actually after the, uh, after the 29 crash. The foreword, I mean. Moreover, at the present time, the interest of mankind in the prospects of business is greatly accentuated by reason of a business depression of unprecedented extent and severity, or what Sir Arthur Salter terms an unprecedented financial crisis. Conditions are such that, in the thought of the average man who thinks of such things at all, the salvation of the world from anarchy and ruin depends upon the speedy revival of manufacture and trade, while among those who delve into the mysteries of economics, there are many who predict the nearby collapse of the whole system of credit capitalism, by which the industries and commerce of the nations are controlled. In that vast heterogeneous conglomerate of nationalized and industrialized humanity, which constitutes the Christendom of today, extends its fringes into the domains of heathendom, the conservative element, whence it derives all its stabilizing, preservative, and invigorating influences, is the unorganized but vitally coherent Israel of God, with its gospel of salvation and healing for all men, the little leaven dispersed throughout the mass which leaveneth the whole lump, the salt of the earth which preserves the decaying mass from utter destruction, whereas the ravaging, disintegrating, disruptive element which eventually will compass the downfall of the whole system of international credit capitalism, is the well-organized, though widely scattered, Israel after the flesh, which long has occupied all positions of economic vantage and controls all the sinews of production and commerce. So, I thought that was fascinating. That, that's not even the end of the foreword, but what a picture of two, two Israels. Israel of the flesh and Israel of the Spirit. And indeed, I think, regardless of whether you're talking about what's going on in the headlines, you know, today or tomorrow, or you're trying to figure out how it's all really going to, you know, play out with a one-world system in the end of days as a whole, this is so crucial. And, it, and, you know, how much more does it make sense today when we see, the, you know, international finance? I mean, this is what the whole technocracy is all about. You know, everything that happened with COVID... And uh, so many things that went on as a part of that that people are already trying to push out of their minds. And it's amazing how much easier that is when the media is you know, suddenly getting everyone spun up about terrorism again. And it's, it's like we're going back 22 years to September of 2001. And suddenly Islamic Jihad is the big boogeyman that's going to get everyone. Even though, you know, national borders are racist and uh, it's, just, it's just amazing to watch the whole machine kind of at work. After living through, you know, September 11th and all the years of Afghanistan and Iraq, I you know, never went over there, but having seen all that, all the propaganda, the war machine, and just seeing it come back and play again, it's just, I gotta admit, it's been hard to even really want to even think about it or talk about it myself, like this new pivot back because it's just, like, what else is there even left to say? You know, if you haven't been paying attention to everything that has been playing out over and over again from the towers of international finance, <laughs> who are somehow always involved, and yet this time around, we're on the eve of the alleged breakthrough of artificial intelligence and how that's going to revolutionize everything, and central bank digital currencies are waiting in the wings and already being implemented in certain countries and all on the heels of vaccine passports and, and all this. 
So, you know, you don't have to explain to people that all this crazy stuff is going on. But what I really appreciate about this book by Philip Morrow so far is that by patiently going through all the, the visions and the, the symbolism and using the Old Testament itself, it's basically, you know, the, the main takeaway so far is that the seven trumpets and the seven seals and the seven bowls or vials are, you know, these things are not necessarily in chronological order to each other. Like each set, like the, it's topographical rather than chronological. I mean, the chronological within the seven of each set, but there's not like one comes after the other comes after the, after the other. And they all three kind of end at the same conclusion of the glorious return of Christ and the judgment of the nations and it's the day of the Lord. You know, like, so it's not just like one build up all the way to the end and that kind of even ties into trying to understand what the millennium, the thousand years is all about as well. That these things are indeed symbolic. So, as I said, I myself am trying to kind of continue to, you know, I don't pretend to have it all figured out in terms of the specifics of is the Antichrist even a, a singular individual leader person, or is it, because that's another thing Morrow kind of seems to not necessarily uh, believe that it's, it's a singular guy, but maybe a singular humanity or singular new entity that is this hybrid of we've talked ad nauseum about the image of the beast and AI and all that. So I don't know. I have a lot of a lot of things that I, I don't pretend to know exactly how it'll pan out. But the question of who Israel is, it's amazing how that is so simple and straightforward in Scripture that it's really, it's such a non-negotiable. Like, there's no way to get around. It, it's, it's the core of the gospel. And so that's kind of why the whole thing with, like, well, Jesus wouldn't beat his bride and all that. I mean, you know, I'm not trying to argue with people about, you know, pre-trib pre-wrath, you know, it's if that itself is a salvific issue. It's not. But when you're getting into, like, who is Israel? Who are the promises really given to? Who are the receivers of the inheritance? Well, it's always about Christ. Like, you can't get away from it being defined by Christ. So this idea that, well, like, that's why we've got to support, you know, this nation state or that war, because that's how God's going to save this group of people after we're all gone. You know, God loves his bride. But he loves that bride too, but he's going to, they're going to have to go through stuff and be saved. You know, why can God save? <laughs> this is the amazing kind of contradiction that I keep kind of tripping out about. Like the whole narrative, the whole Zion, Christian Zionist narrative is kind of built around this idea that God is going to save them and then they will repent. They will look upon whom they have pierced and, you know, they will cry out to God and there'll be this massive conversion revival because of Jesus coming down to fight for them and preserve them. Which is like, okay, if that's that's the argument, why can't God do that for the rest of the bride? <laughs> or the, 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 the so-called, this is what dispensationalism is all about, right? It's like, well, God has a plan for the Jews and a plan for the Gentiles for salvation. Even though for the Jews, it's, it's like, okay, forget all the, the last 2,000 years. Apparently, it's like, he can't save the Jews until <laughs> he brings them back into the land and they make a, a peace treaty with, with some guy who then breaks the treaty. And, you know, you got Gog, Magog, or whatever. You got a war, and Jesus is going to come down and defeat all these armies. Like, that's the only way he can save them, somehow. But the whole thing is built on that, like, God can interv God can defeat the a whole worldwide coalition of people against this little tiny nation state. And that God is going to be the one to save and preserve his remnant, his bride. But it's like, well, that, and that narrative is fine for, for that scenario, but not for us. Like that, that's the contradiction that I think is just one that I had not even really thought about before until I heard about the uh, Lord wouldn't beat his bride. I mean, like John wrote the whole book of, you know, the whole book of Revelation is the account of the vision that John received while he was in exile on an island called Patmos. And most of the other apostles at that point were already killed for their faith in many in very gruesome ways. So it's hard because like, how do you, I don't know, it's just amazing. If anything, it kind of, I feel challenged that like, okay, how can we flip it back around to where we're thinking about ourselves as the Israel of God and the children of the inheritance and those who are called to patiently endure through whatever may come where we have that same confidence in the intervention of God, not to save us in some battle of Armageddon, or maybe it is, but maybe it's just not, you know, with tanks and bombs and hydrosonic missiles and nuclear, you know, and how much of this stuff is even, I mean, this is what's amazing. 
the more I think about cosmology and this whole, you know, journey of looking into into things like NASA and the whole progression of supposedly exploring space and going to the moon and how many of these narratives and archetypes were, you know, this cartoon came out how many years before Apollo, but like so much of it had been already scripted out in various, various like fictional little imaginings beforehand. But yeah, he, this little film strip is like, this is the footage I, I was looking for when I first heard this crazy idea about the Earth being flat, like uh, that's that's absurd. We would have so many videos of and film of, of people taking off and oh, they're in the ball getting further and further away and going to Google and, and just being shocked, like that this didn't exist, at least not in the form that you would you would think it would. And how many pictures of the Earth from space are there really? Oh, and they're all composites and just how that really not even just being about like the shape of the earth is some magical piece of knowledge that has all this theological import in and of itself because it's it really doesn't when you know so much of, of what gets argued about but really what almost the most significant part of it was re like realizing like how powerful media and narratives really are and you can paint things into the mind and into the heart and on like deep emotional levels by using the power of media which, of course, is <laughs> all ultimately built by this giant worldwide kingdom of international finance. And being able to appreciate, like, how how deceived we really are about so many things and not just necessarily... I mean, th this is what's crazy. Like, how many how many Bible prophecy teachers today are, are you know, when they're talking about I Iran and, and how this or that is going to play out. And they're, you know, and they just start quoting Bloomberg and the New York Times. And, oh, this country has nukes and this country has hypersonic missiles and this kind... You know, and they're just, like, regurgitating so many things that it doesn't even occur to them to even question the idea that maybe they don't only even exist in print or in news reports you've never you've never verified even the existence of these particular technologies or the veracity of all sorts of narratives like i could sit here all day talking about all the things that now i don't even necessarily take as fact just because it was in the news or just because it was science <laughs> science claims it's true you know and that has been the real blessing of, of it all it's not even just about like you need to know exactly like you know what the firmament's made out of or you know, how the sun moon and stars work there's so many open-ended questions but the open-ended question about the things of man is like one of the whole blessings of it all and just going back to the scripture and so even though there's all these things that like we may or may not even know what to believe about what's on tv what's on the news what's you know being taught in universities a scientific fact or what the military industrial complex make claims to have capabilities of and how much of it is smoke and mirrors and i mean it's like you know psyops upon psyops upon psyops but knowing who israel is and knowing i mean that's the world view that is quite indispensable to the christian faith regardless of what time you live in but especially in our time and understanding the difference between these two invisible kingdoms that are ultimately going to come to a head that this is really what the whole you know if you want to call it the time of jacob's trouble if we're if jacob you know who was who became israel and we're talking about the israel of the spirit that that this is what the enemy wants to destroy and eradicate from the earth this is really the agenda of the enemy is faith in Christ. That is the Antichrist spirit that was even active in Jesus' own day, in the time of the apostles, and it has never stopped. And there have been many Antichrists throughout the ages and much more throughout our time, false messiahs, you know, whether it's transhumanism, whether it's religious dominionism, or patriotism, you know, wanting a savior, wanting this salvation, wanting someone to rise up and take up the cause. And however that's going to play out in, in whatever political or, or whatever, you know, we'll see. But we know who, we know who the real salvation comes through. And so it, it's amazingly simple when you just let the word of God define where we are, how everything was made, how we fell, how the world got this way, who God really is, and what we are really truly offered through Christ, an eternal kingdom, an eternal inheritance, an eternal wedding, marriage, marriage level intimacy with the creator who loves his bride and who laid down his life for her, who laid down his life for us. That was the intervention. That was how he came down to save. And when he comes again, it will be to judge. 
And so, I mean, that in itself kind of destroys this whole bifurcated dispensationalist theology alone. Who is the bride? And are we more focused on the unpleasant things or the scary things that we may have to endure for a few short years on the face of the earth in our mortal bodies that are going to die eventually as sure as anything? Or are we looking forward to that day when the bridegroom arrives and the door is opened and we have eternity to spend with everyone who ever lived who loves God? What kind of salvation, what kind of, what can the world offer that even compares even remotely to that? The resurrection, the resurrection at the day of the Lord. I don't understand why a select generation of people living on the earth at a specific time, why that, why it's so pivotal that you have to be raptured out so that you don't experience whatever economic hardship or imprisonment or death or whatever as if these things aren't already going on and the persecution has not already been underway for actually 2,000 years because it has so that's the world view that I think is the real cosmological you know line in the sand if you want to put it that way that the shape of Mount Zion what is Mount Zion who is Mount Zion I just feel called to try and even in my own life, try and reorient my own thinking and my own heart to seeing it all through the lens of the bride, of being the bride, who's been washed and redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. And that he who laid down his own, his own life for us is more than capable of sustaining us and protecting us and giving us victory through everything that the enemy might throw at us for our short lifespans on this earth. And that it's not, it's not this defeatist, it's not a defeatist uh, stance or some, you know, abusive husband <laughs> eschatology. No, it's the opposite of that. That God has already protected us from so much in many ways. And it's amazing that we even still have the abundance of reassurance uh, through his word and, and through his faithfulness, not ours. So, thanks so much for watching and for listening if you made it this far. Been kind of a long one, but um, hopefully it made some sense. And uh, appreciate everyone who's supported me on Patreon and PayPal and all that um, through the links I got for that. So I know I don't thank you guys enough, but I really do appreciate just everything you guys have done over the years. And you know how we've all kind of been on this journey together, trying to understand like what God has really revealed about His creation and His world and His plan for His people, for those He loves. So thanks for watching, and keep looking up.
And uh, someone sat down with me. Uh, I have a couple of degrees from Louisiana Tech University. And I studied out the theory of evolution on how we arrived here, how the cosmos arrived here, how the earth arrived here. What actually brought me here was I never had read the biblical account. So once I read the biblical account and I stacked it up against the, the uh, Darwinism, <clears throat> I, some fellow showed me that the 2,000 years ago this Jesus of Nazareth came on the scene. It was God in flesh. He died on a cross for all that in life, was put in a tomb and resurrected from the dead. And when I started to kind of realize that dead men could live again, I could either put my faith in this evolution thing where there's no hope, or put my faith in the Almighty and that Jesus of Nazareth was really who he said he was. So based on that, the Bible claims that Jesus left the earth about 33 AD, went back to heaven where he came from, and he now rules. And a lot of people in this society, they don't think so, but uh, I put my faith in that. I was baptized in water for the remission of my sins. And that, in a nutshell, is the good news about Jesus. I know this, it was good news for me. So a lot of people might think, well, so from the 60s to now, now I can follow Jesus and I can still be in a, a lifestyle of not being worldly. I can see, in other words, the Bible says that we're to live our lives here as strangers and aliens. So the bottom line is, most people who run up on me down here, they do think I'm kind of strange. You know, I say, Jesus, number one, boys, there's the only way I know of when we're getting out of here. Unless y'all have another better idea. Most people kind of scratch their heads and say, mm. So I'm putting my faith in the biblical record. At least I have a great hope when I physically die of having my body resurrected from the ground. It's very simple. <laughs>